episode three was, oh my God. As a fan, I thought, wow. As a DP, I thought, fuck. If you take Hard Home, and you take Bob, and you take The Lake, and you add them together, add a five by four, you have episode three. had 11 weeks of night shooting, so that was quite a feat for any crew to go through. We knew this episode was going to be almost entirely battle. It's well over an hour, and it's mostly action. And part of what we cared about a lot here was getting Miguel on board and forcing him to shoot 55 straight nights. Look at this way. I never, ever want to do that again. I don't think anybody who did that ever wants to do it again. Yeah, that was that was tough. And I don't think it was something that anybody really realized just how hard it was going to be. The long night. When I was doing it, it was minus 14. Just chilling. Minus 14. In a field. You know, it's too cold to snow. When it's too cold to snow, you know you've got trouble. Chris and the rest of the team, they were there day in, day out. We would start your evening at 6 o'clock at night, and then you'd go home at, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning, and it just, that's brutal. Your body never acclimates to that 100%. By, like, week three, say, like people looked slightly haunted. Cast, stunts, background, crew, like everybody just looked like, this is, this is, like, getting into us. <laughs> This is like getting into our spirits. I'm, I'm not going to lie, it, I, it, it was horrible. <laughs> we enjoyed the work, and I said to my guys, you know, you might not want to do it again, but you won't regret doing it the first time. Because the product, the, what you've achieved, is amazing. I think the crew, they enjoyed the, the result is, you know, you didn't do all this and think, that's not really impressive. There's no doubt about it. It's a really impressive sequence. And I think the nights are just one of the things we're just going to get through this. It's just another notch in the belt of the crew on Game of Thrones that they've done things that feel quite unique. I'm proud of everyone. I'm proud of the work that was put in. I think it was a, a mammoth task that we were faced with, and we did it. And it just feels incredible. That first week after night shoot, seeing the crew, like, smiling at the sun. What they went through was, was pretty stunning. And uh, look, it's not, you know, there's no special prize for being the toughest crew, but there probably should be. Working in the pitch dark in the rain and the mud, it's a real testament to the entire Belfast crew who gave us something that no amount of money could ever buy. The task that we had, which was the primary task on three, is how do we keep this interesting? Because simply battle fatigue, you know, you just get bored, you get exhausted. We really wanted to make sure we were telling a coherent story with the whole thing and not just having battle beat, battle beat, battle beat. There needs to be a shape to it and a propulsion to it. It became clear when we started planning it that the battle was going to be a series of concentric circles. It would be walls of defenses failing, and the dead getting closer and closer to the center and to the heart of Winterfell and taking over everything. The way that I concepted episode three visually was to create a color scheme that developed throughout the whole episode. So it starts with a moonlit night. Because the Night King brings a storm, and the clouds, the moon becomes dissipated and the moonlight takes over, but in a very diffused kind of way. And then the next stage would be the trench going up. We wanted the trench to be this overpowering light. And in prep for a long time, Miguel always mentioned hell to me. It's turning into hell for each character. So the, the blood red fire of the trench takes over the image and completely drains out the blue of the moon until the end, because the trench is dying down. The moonlight suddenly gets introduced again. So that was kind of the way for me to, to break it up into sections. So you have something that's visually different, so it's refreshing in that respect. But how do we take it one step further? And so what we decided was to give each act a genre. So basically, act one is suspense and is build up. 
And the best way to do build up is in any sort of kind of monster movie, which is what this is, is to not see the monster. Act two is actually from the moment that Arya is on the back foot and enters into the castle, that's the horror movie. And then act three is an action movie. <laughs> And so by breaking it into genres, it allowed us to change rhythm and go off on tangents where we followed specific characters for a longer period of time rather than worried about what was happening to everyone else. The core of it is the people you care about. You want to care about the people fighting, so every effort is made to make sure that you center that conflict around the people you know. And so whether it's Arya's storyline or Sansa and Tyrion down the crypt or Jon Snow and Danny up in the dragons. It's kind of like all these separate little battles within the greater battle. Ah, oh, fuck. I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. living do you have some time to prepare for this battle and one of the things they know going into it is that they're going to be outnumbered and another thing they know is that the whites um, don't like fire so they dig a massive trench around the entire castle and fill it with kindling to read the word trench on the page it doesn't sound like anything but it took such a lot of work to try and uh, resolve it to a point that it was a convincing method of defense it was important that this trench not be something that anybody could jump over. So we needed to construct these bridges that would then collapse and create another barrier. The trench had real wooden spikes, real wooden logs lining throughout the trench. Then the real logs were replaced by steel logs that could burn over a number of weeks without burning away. It had to accommodate a whole special effects rig. So the considerations are enormous. And in the end, the trench sort of encompasses pretty much the whole of the castle. As trenches go, it was a good trench. <laughs> and I've done some trenches. <laughs> light the trenches! And then the reality of how do you light a 900-foot-long thing full of bitumen with hundreds of people running at it and stun people in it? Oh, I mean... So. <laughs> the complicated process of the trenches began with the, you know, the concept of it being a first line of defense. Therefore, it had to be impressive, it had to be very big. So we had to devise a way we could produce a flame which is big enough for outside environment. So we came up with, with a system which is uh, just a simple water trough. It makes the most economical flame out of propane. And then, of course, you've got to think about the consumable part of it. You can't have real logs in there. It has to be a steel thing. It has to be able to endure the, the heat and the fire. I think we did 900 steel logs and we did uh, 16 steel troughs. And then you have to work out how you get that amount of gas to each trough. We've got one four-ton tanker with a um, mobile unit, which is uh, five ton. So in, in a combination of two, we convert um, liquid into the gas, and that's what gives us our gas supply. We went running off a electronic valve system that's tied in with a firing box. And each one's ignited by an individual gas bang in a sequence. It uses a lot of gas, and a lot of gas. Have we you got your gas bill? I've got my gas bill, yeah. I'm, I'm dreading that one. <laughs> and you see the Red Priestess come out and, and light that trench, that that would be such an extraordinary moment as it just whoosh, lights around Winterfell. In terms of imagery, I always thought that was such a fantastic thing. So you really were seeing for the first time the ice and the fire meeting. So that was something that I thought was a really lovely image to establish. Miguel, like a year before we started shooting. Basically, was like, I can't tell you anything, but get your endurance up now. I want you to be training. You have a lot to do. It's going to be night shoots. We're going to do three months of night shoots. And I was just like, 
okay. Like, I think I was, like, in Boston at the time, like, eating, like, cheese fries. Like, cool. <laughs> A fight through the battlements. It was just a real great moment, and everything that I have learned really did come down to that, and I did use every sort of skill that I'd learned in that fight. It's one thing to go on the battlements, but then over the top of Winterfell, you've got these two staircases that go up to the middle section of Castellation. So we thought it would be really claustrophobic and dark and scary to be in there with whites, but that's when the, the full staff doesn't really work. We all know these tunnels are very small, and the last thing you want is a five and a half or a six foot quarter staff going through small little alleyways. So what I decided to do in this one, be able to cut it in half so it'd be able to disassemble within the five sequence and then have two of them she could use both in each hand, which was great. And it gave Arthur then the stunts something else to play with and to train with. Yeah, because if I concentrate yeah. on doing the move, one of them does it and then the other yeah. one doesn't. And it's like... One of the incredible things about Maisie is that she's a righty. Um, because Arya in the books is left-handed, she decided she was going to learn how to fight left-handed. So in season one, when she's training with Sirio Pharrell, she's training with her left hand, and which is incredibly challenging. But what it did mean was that she's learned how to fight left-handed, and she's naturally right-handed, so she's become an ambidextrous fighter. And Maisie does almost all this stuff on her own. She has an excellent stone woman for the for the dangerous stuff, but most of it's actually amazing. Her coordination and she's she's really quick. You know, can can make changes on the spot. And it actually she's really easy to work with. It's one thing practicing a fight, which is like a spar, a sparring fight, you know. But then when you're actually fighting for your life with loads of stuntmen who like do this day to day and are not scared of anything and they're covered in this crazy makeup and they're coming at you like Rah! it's just a completely different ball game and uh, I think I probably hold the record for the most apologies on set. <laughs> Fucking hell, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. They're fine. They've got pads on. We knew any situation where lots of people are, are fighting, Ari needs to play a central role because she's one of the best at it. That's, that's amazing, and it's a lot of fun to watch, but it's also it's one note, and to try to play that note through the whole episode, it wouldn't have worked. So having her wounded and having her almost taken out of commission and almost, almost rewinding the clock on who Arya Stark is would really be interesting it would also give us a chance to change up the nature of the, the story we were telling the library sequence was built around the idea of i need to have a marked shift where the audience instead of coming back and going okay and more battle they come back and they go oh change the style. Hopefully what it does is it refreshes the audience and they're like, you know, we want to know what's going on outside, but we're okay to be inside for a minute and slow things down. And we're also okay to be with Aya, who's suddenly, from being this incredibly confident character that she's been now for quite some time, is completely traumatized by what's happened to her. One of the things we did when we shot that sequence is we uh, designed the library in a certain way, and then I took Maisie in there, and I got nine whites or something in there, and I gave them all a path, and then I told her she had to make her way through it without being seen. And we figured out this whole choreographed piece where everything was a near miss, and everything was just about not seeing, and everything had to be silent. And it was really fun to do. Oh my God, so scary. <laughs> so the hero whites in the library, a gal, he was after somebody who could get themselves into quite an interesting uh, position, but have a physique which would be a little bit unworldly, which would suggest they're dead, basically. I, I knew of this performer, a Spanish performer, um, called Javier Botet, and he's double, triple jointed. He can do the most ridiculous things with his body. And he's been covered in prosthetics pretty much all his career. So I knew he was the guy that could 
pretty much sell it for us. From a prosthetics point of view, he's got a couple of little bits and pieces. He's got some little cheap burn appliances. We've got a few little scrapes and wounds. And then we just did this sort of airbrushed body painting on him as well and just really accentuated all his sort of shadows and all his muscles and his bone structure. And his movement just sold it for us. with Leanna Mormont. I think the whole world is. So we wanted this to be her absolute heroic moment. Oh, when I found out I was dying, it was like, it was the best thing, really. It sounds, it sounds strange, but I either decided I'd be happy if I ended up on the throne, which I thought was very, very unlikely, or I had a great death. So I'm very happy. And the whole giant thing, that's just really cool. Hey! All this, the shots with Leanna and Crumb uh, were all really pretty complicated, and they all had lots of pieces to them. So it started out at Tomb, where we shot the Winterfell set, and we shot a lot of the backgrounds for the shots. And where we wanted to frame for Giant, we used this technology called InCam, and this allowed us to play back sort of an animation of what the Giant's performance would be that was synced to the camera. And so that when Sean Savage, who's the A camera operator, is operating on the day, he can actually see the giant at his proper scale in the set. So they were able to operate it as if it was a real thing. Hey, guys. Yeah, that's better for you to that out. The giant is real. He could be 3D, but we prefer to shoot real organic live photograph people wherever we can. Our giant performer, Ian White, who's seven foot five, I believe. He performed all the actions of the giant in front of green screen, but we shot him in a way to double his scale. For the shots where he had to pick up Liana, we put tracking markers on a green doll that he picked up, and we motion captured that and would use it to drive a robotic arm, basically, to pick up our actress, Bella and that would move her around as if she's being held by Crumb. You know, for some of those shots, there's at least four or five different elements that we've photographed at different times that will all go into making that final shot. Really, it's just bringing the lowest techs, you know, miniature props approach and the very highest tech, you know, digital scaling and digital handoffs. I think it's very fitting for Liana to die, like doing something like that, stabbing a giant in the eye. It's a bit like, I realized today, it's a bit like David and Goliath, the same sort of thing. Um, like just a stab in the eye kills him. <laughs> but with this little Liana moment. Down in the crypt becomes just a complete horror movie. It's terrifying down there. We're in a crypt. Nobody thought of that. He's bringing all the dead people back to life, and they put the women and children in a crypt with all the dead people. So, rah. Tyrion is smart, but I guess not that smart. Yeah, the whole action was really fun, because I never get to do any action. In between setups, Peter and I would be joking around like guns, like running between the, like podium to podium, trying to catch a white. We felt like uh, action stars, even though we probably ran like five meters. With the whites in the crypt, for us that was exciting because realized we were going to do some really cool mummified and dried husky sort of um, whites. We referenced ancient mummies, we looked at corpses, and there are some tombs which have got these figures, which are exactly the inspiration we were looking for. And they're these dried, wizened bodies, which still have dried, encrusted skin all over them. They still have hair, and they're hundreds and hundreds of years old. They have their teeth really, really dusty, and completely different to what we'd seen before. There was one point where I had to, like, run through a crowd of people 
and whites were coming out. And one came up to me and I actually started crying. I was so scared. Like, I, I, <laughs> whenever I get scared, I just cry and it was so awful. Those whites are horrible, just as scary in real life. I hate them. <laughs> They're around dark corners, and you're like, you don't fully know where they're all coming from. I mean, everything's safe and, and mapped out, but it's still, you get into it, and you're just going by candlelight. We don't have any other lighting sources down there, really. It's creepy. It was fun. A week underground with dead people. such nice people that you know we it's, it's just such violence that we're portraying and uh, and I've often said how did we end up here I think the lesson that we learned on Battle of the Bastards was just how difficult it is to work with dead bodies to work with these prop bodies how expensive it is how difficult they are to move around so Rob Cameron and Gavin Jones our our prop maker uh, came up with the idea of moulding these bodies into these discs. The brief was to try and create um, a lightweight version of bodies as a sort of relief. We would get eight or nine dummies dressed in their armour and then we would make a huge mould of that. So our mould could capture all of this detail. The limbs and the fabric and the armour had, I think, probably about 300 body parts, in, which we would have painted up in different elements, you know, give them some skin tone, give them a bit of a palette, and individually pull out each body. And the good thing about these, the weight of them, we could actually mound them up. Um, so the prop boys came up with this great idea of wedges and then building them up. So it's total carnage and devastation, really. It looks great. I've got to say, they work really, really well. The prop guys will never want to see another one of these discs again because they spend a hell of a lot of their time walking them around, moving them from the right flank. OK, now we've got to dress the left flank, so all the bodies have to move across to the left flank. Fucking hell! For close-up stuff, interspersed with that would be live people dressed as dead bodies. When you walk on set sometimes and, and they're about to shoot, and suddenly one of them will twitch or sort of move or something, and it's like, oh my god, because that's actually a, an extra who's being dressed as a dead body and will sort of be in there in amongst the ones that we've put in. Yeah, it's very disconcerting. It's, <laughs> it's a strange place to be. last third of the movie where we move into an action film, John realizes that the real task still at hand is to essentially protect Bran. Bran! No! And so he heads into Winterfell and we follow him on a journey. We've used Artemis Maxima. It's a handheld device. Either the camera operator or the grip can carry it. And then one of the camera operators will uh, operate it remotely. You know, it's like uh, it's like a remote control steady cam, really. It's, it's very clever. The camera flows through the castle and uh, stays with the character. I think the audience are going to feel like they're traveling with them and, you know, right up front with them. That was the real kind of heart of, I think, the that episode is, is that long sequence with all those different characters. We needed John to make his way through the courtyard and bear witness to all of the characters that we know and we care about, uh, that he knows and he cares about being overwhelmed. What we essentially did is we took each group of people and we gave them all a fight, they learned the fight and then we shot the fight and then we used little pieces of it. They were all losing battles. Yeah, I've got to do like a flippy move. I've got to fling my spear like around my head. I like doing that stuff. Bit of flair. I loved, loved filming the sequence where we are really up against it and it is overwhelming for Brienne. Brienne is in battle mode. It was really all-encompassing that night. Being there was so intimidating and so, you know, we were all really panicked by how claustrophobic it was. And I think that really adds to the work. 
Uh, one of my highlights from that episode was standing on the pile of bodies and fighting for my life. And the funny thing was that we, we said to the stunt guys, if you manage to get me down, take me down. So on some takes, I died, <laughs> or Torment died. I was really fighting for my life. Christopher's life. <laughs> Strong arms now. One of the shots that I really love there is John looks over at his best, sees his best friend being attacked by all these whites. And in any other circumstance, John would, of course, rush over to try to help Samuel. It was great because it was this idea of Sam being one person John has always gone back for, has always relied on, has always been his true friend, and that he had to sacrifice him to go after the Night King. And then it was finalized with a moment where, at some point, we just ran out of stunt guys to throw at Sam. And so he sat there, and he just started crying. And it was great, because it truly was crying amidst all this violence, so seeing John do that with Sam, I thought was a really, really great. Again, it was he felt true to the character. If you're involved in a battle scene, you like to see yourself as a fighter, and you like to make it look as good as you possibly can. And Miguel was the one who had to keep reining me in and say, remember, you're playing Samuel Tarly, and Samuel Tarly is not a fighter. The reason that Sam is in there is because he's not a fighter, and it's because he can show how normal people would cope. So we had to really dull him down, and we just make it in such a way that we wouldn't allow him to be cool. We just put him under so much pressure, which is not fair to him as a person, because we could prob we could do it to everybody else too. But we just don't. We just you know we make Kit look really cool. We do. We you know it's, it's like all right. What can we do to make Kit look cooler? One of the most challenging shots was when we travelled through the courtyard extensively and then we head down to what we used to call the old kennels. And as he's running down this very long, dark corridor, we had to coordinate about 15 stuntmen dropping out of the roof around him. They're obviously going to arrive in a certain zone, certain moments, certain seconds. Ah! Which, between the stunt guys and Kit, they had to coordinate perfectly. I'm against the wall, now put it on his neck and then get out. Take your time. I, I wouldn't kill him. I wouldn't kill him until we see the next fight. And everything was really based around the idea of, like, how can we make it feel as messy as possible? But then we had to obviously put one of our stabilised handheld rigs behind him and still stay really close to him to make the audience feel that jeopardy, the danger of what was happening. After we've choreographed it and rehearsed it, what have you, um, when we're shooting it, you know, my job is the safety of it and also making sure that it all works. And then I'm queuing because obviously we all need to be in sync. That was probably one of the greatest challenges, just to be in the right time at the right place, and it had to be in you know fractions of seconds to do it. And the camera did 180 round him at one point during all this chaos. Um, and we run backwards at that point until a great big steel door is iron, iron railings are shut right in front of these guys at the last second. And it feels like Jon Snow's just got through there, as has just the cameras just got through as well. So, yeah, it's a very cool shot. Go, 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 go. Let's go, man. Yeah, just because we fancy <laughs> making you do it again. <laughs> but ultimately, the key thing there was to give Kit the fight of his life, um, and then at the end of it, present him with a, an insurmountable odd, which is a dead dragon. Or an undead one, or not dead. Zombie dragon lands, having his face been torn off, can't exactly see, smashes through the ravenry. Just an insane fight where John is ducking behind these pieces of set as this icy blue fire is blasting over the top of him. But the fun thing is that Viserion is so damaged by this point, he already has a, a hole through his neck from being taken down by the Night King. Now he's missing half his face, so he's leaking. So, you know, this blue fire is kind of leaking and shooting around. 
There's fire blasting all over the place, which we shoot photographically for real using a 3D motion control camera, blasting fire in a darkened stage. We actually did laser cuts for uh, Viserion from the digital model of those openings, and then bronze casts were made and then fitted by Sam Conway and his team with fire jets. And then that was put onto the, this robot with the quick arm so that the fire would leak out of openings that were accurate to the dragon. There were so many moving parts in this scene because you've got the environment he's living in, which is partially the courtyard dressed and largely virtual because of the destruction that's needed to be created. There's shooting Kit in the set piece so that he's got something to really duck behind and have interactive lighting wrap around him. We did a lot of destruction in that courtyard. We like building things, but equally we like destroying things. That's always quite good fun. So we go at it with flamethrowers, paint, earth, mud, you name it. We just take it in there and do whatever it takes to destroy the thing. I asked for a load of wood to be removed. We made a huge bonfire of it. We burn it for about a day until it's charcoal, it's almost destroyed. Then actually you get something rather beautiful. It's rather wonderful. Just when you think that it's all over, and just when you think that Jon Snow is gonna be the hero again, we realize that Arya peers through the mist. Get him. I'm not gonna get him. And then they really go like, oh, maybe John's gonna get him. Wait, he's not gonna. And I remember actually being like, whoa! And kind of applauding in my head and then being like, yeah! <laughs> and then in the read through, when like, when Maisie was doing it, and we were all just like whooping and cheering. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I think Maisie thought it was super cool. Like, she was like, yeah, I can kill him. Um, Kit was really fine with it. I was pissed. I was pissed that it wasn't me killing the Night King. I could have, I, I would have, I would have given you like, I'd have bet you thousands before we read the finals. I was like, yeah, it's definitely me. And then they lead you on that John's chasing the Night King. Jon Snow has always been the hero, the one who's been the savior, but it just didn't seem right to us for this moment. It's probably three years now or something we've known that it was going to be Arya who delivers that fatal blow. Dan and David let me break all the Game of Thrones rules for that sequence. Majority of it is shot at 96 frames a second. It's all super slow motion. It's all heightened reality, which is not what they usually do. It's a surreal nightmare. Finally, the Night King and Bran were finding each other. The music plays a big part in creating that sense of despair that should exist in that moment. And you're intercutting with John, who's clearly not going to make it. And you're intercutting with all our other characters, where they're just, they're so fucked. Everybody's fucked. I mean, that was literally, that was the phrase we kept using. It's like, let's do the it's fucked shot. And then everyone would, would shoot a shot where it just was like, there's no escape. Everyone's going to die right now. And you know they're not, but we want you to feel that same feeling of, oh my God, it's, it can't. What's the recovery? How do we come back from this? And we've all forgotten about, you know, that little innocent girl from all those years ago who's turned into a train killer who's coming out of nowhere. Essentially, she does jump out of nowhere, and that's a wire rig. It's a wire rig we did on the location, but the location wasn't ideal. It was really hard to get a crane in there, and we've obviously got the weirwood tree. So it was tricky to do it there, and we did a version of it there, but then we had to redo it because it didn't have the ability to control it as much as we'd hoped, and it needed to be a real boom out of nowhere moment and a real, you know, a locking together of these two characters. That was tedious, but so great to be able to perform all these different beats within maybe like two seconds of footage. I knew it had to be Valerian Steel. 
to the exact spot where the child of the forest put the dragon glass blade to create the Night King. And that weapon has been one of the totemic pieces for us. And ultimately, we've known for a long, long time that was going to end the Night King. When Samwell's reading the book about dragon glass, there is a picture of the dagger. The Targaryens used dragon glass to decorate the weapons without even knowing what the first men used it for. It is very possible that the same thing that created the Night King is the thing that was necessary to destroy the Night King, or maybe it's Valyrian steel. Or... Figure it out for yourself, I'm not gonna say. But I think that's such a, a nice little full circle thing as well, that that's the knife that was destined to kill Bran, and here it is saving him. Yeah, it's like a, an iconic moment. You know, the fall of the dead. It's exactly what you need. <laughs> like, out of the air, she, like, takes him down. It's so good. It's so good. Perfect. I think it's, a, it's an inspired move. Um, you've always been waiting as to what purpose Arya's assassin's skills are going to lead to, and it's for the most important purpose. Reading what I get to achieve and Arya's whole purpose in this world and everything she's trained for comes down to this one episode. It's just amazing. And it just, it was beautiful. It's poetry. And I'm grateful that it was me and not Kit. <laughs>
it's no, it's just great fun and uh yeah i was so really very very chuffed to be a part of the whole mad wonderful thing of it all <laughs> <laughs>